so much. It is so great to be here in Prescott. And before I plunge into uh, into all of that, uh, I want to say hi to David. And uh, David, I want you to be the first member of your class at Notre Dame Law School to have an offer of summer employment. <laughs> uh, like to come back home, uh, sort of home, Phoenix, uh, you know, an hour and a half away, uh, and join the, the, uh, uh, the best group of constitutional litigators in the country. We'd love to have you. Okay. So, well, thank you. Parents, you. Uh, uh, I'd like to introduce my family, um, uh, my son Ryan and my daughter Kaylee. Uh, who are joining us tonight, uh, both of them at, at uh, the ripe old ages of 12 and 9 respectively, already freedom fighters. Uh, you should see Ryan's uh, comic books that uh, depict uh, a certain president in the United States as a comic book villain. And, uh, so really, we're lucky to have them, and I'm going to introduce my wife uh, a little later and ask her to to just say uh, a few words uh, to you this evening as well. But we're really, really excited and happy to be in Prescott. And I know that people um, always say they're happy to be where they are, but uh, Prescott holds a very, very special place in Shauna's and my hearts. Um, we actually fell in love with Prescott uh, many years ago, and I can remember the exact moment when we both fell in love with Prescott. It was shortly after the election of Barack Obama. And Sean and I were possibly clinically depressed. I, I think probably others in this room can share that feeling. And for whatever reason, we found ourselves in, in Prescott for the rodeo. And we were assembled there with thousands of people waiting to see the rodeo. And first, uh, we had a, a prayer, and then we sang the Star Spangled Banner. And I looked around at the people surrounding us, and I said to Shauna, what percentage of the people surrounding us do you think voted for Barack Obama? <laughs> and she said, 16%? My, my guess was like 18%. And we just felt at home. We felt surrounded by real Americans, and every time we come back here, we really feel like we're coming home, and coming home to, to friends and family, and so thank you for doing what you do. You know, normally you come to, a, you meet a, a, a tax watchdog, and it's, it's one guy with a gray ponytail and just, you know, some nervous tics or something like that. <laughs> Only in Prescott would you fill a ballroom with your with your tax watchdogs. I've, I've spoken previously uh, to the Women Republican Club here, which, as you all know, is the biggest in the state. So it's just fantastic. Thank you for keeping the spirit of liberty alive and vibrant. And before I, I make uh, my uh, remarks, I, I'd like to offer a special call out to the guy who gave me such a, a special introduction, John Stevens. Um, as you know, uh, John led, along with many of you, the effort to uh, fight the bond override. It used to be that if you put the words for the children in something, it was absolutely automatically going to win. And so taking on a school override or the, the state sales tax, as, as uh, Treasurer Ducey did uh, in, in the last general election on a statewide basis, that's a really, really tall order. It means getting the facts out. It means overcoming the emotion that is brought. And I did not realize this. I knew that you guys had won that battle, but I did not realize how big you won that battle until John told me that it was 60-40. In addition to that, under John's leadership, he has doubled the size of the organization. So on behalf of the Goldwater Institute, I wanted to present John 
with a gift, which is a set of, of Goldwater Institute bookends, which are incredibly heavy. So I'm really happy to uh, let uh, John take them off my hands. Please join me in, in round. Serious book weights, or uh, book ends. Book weights, yeah. Book weights, yeah. This is easier said than done. You know. Come see me afterwards. <laughs> I think we almost have it. Okay, we'll, we'll get it. Yeah. Oh, okay. They're, uh, there we go. Yes. Yeah, really. <laughs> well, um, I often like to say that I am the luckiest lawyer in the world because I get to choose my cases, I get to choose my clients, and best of all, the people I get to sue are bureaucrats. <laughs> so we have a lot of fun at the Goldwater Institute. I'm very, very excited because 2014 is a, a very significant year for us. It is the year that we are transitioning from a state organization into a national organization. One of the things that, that people probably have not noticed about Arizona is that it, is, it has become the greatest creator of freedom ideas that are exported to other states of any of the states in our country. And at the Goldwater Institute, we like to produce a lot of those ideas, but also bring them around the country. And so this year, we've begun litigating outside of Arizona and also uh, bringing policy ideas. And the last thing I'm going to talk to you about this evening will be one of those ideas, which I think is incredibly exciting. But uh, we've been able to, to litigate some very, very exciting cases. And I always like to talk about one or two. It's always really tough to figure out which ones to choose because they're all so cool, they're all so fun, and they're all so important. But so I'm going to talk to you about two of them tonight, one that is over with and one that is very much ongoing that I think will be of special interest to you. And then I'm going to tell you about two, the two voter uh, measures that are on the November ballot. There's been almost no attention paid to them. Both of them came out of the Goldwater Institute. Uh, my friend Steve Pierce voted uh, to refer both of them to the ballot, um, and I'm really excited about it, so that's what I'm going to uh, also tell you about. The case, uh, the first case that I, I want to tell you about is actually the one case that I have litigated right here in Prescott, uh, right across the street, as a matter of fact. And sometimes, you know, you think about the, the, the big constitutional law cases that are going on, whether it's Obamacare, or other huge cases that are going on, campaign finance and so forth. But it, for me, some of the most important cases, some of the cases I hold most dear, are the little cases. The cases that if we didn't take them on, no one would. And government would simply pulverize people and destroy their rights. And this was such a case, some of you may have read about it at the time, but it was, it was a little case, didn't get a lot of publicity, but boy, did I love litigating. It involved four ladies in a little town I had never heard of until this case, but you probably are all familiar with, called Congress. And these four ladies, which I, I, who I took to calling the Congress four, were tax watchdogs. And they were very concerned about some of the practices uh, that the local school board was engaged with. They felt that they were wasting money, that they were doing dishonest things. And so they were constantly asking the school board for public records and filing public records requests. Now in Congress, you didn't just have to file a public records request for things like uh, expenditures and that sort of thing. If you wanted an agenda for the school board meeting, 
you needed to file a public records request. This was not a model of transparency. <laughs> so these ladies did it, and they drove the school board crazy. So the school board got really upset, and they hired a law firm from Flagstaff, and they filed a lawsuit against these four ladies for harassment. And they asked the court to issue an injunction against these four ladies that would forbid them forever from ever filing another public records request with the school board without first going to the court and asking for permission to do so. This was outrageous. Imagine if you could not get a public record from your government. And I don't even know how we heard about this case because it didn't make the, the newspapers. And these four ladies, they didn't have the resources to go out and hire a lawyer. If, if, if we didn't somehow find out about this case, the injunction may have been issued. So we found out about it. We called them up and, and we said, uh, you know, would you like to, to, to have us represent you? They said, we can't afford to hire a lawyer. We said, we're free. Ooh. And they said, let's go get it. <laughs> and when I saw this, I said to myself, I don't want to beat these guys. I want to beat them so badly that no one will ever try something like this again. And so we went to court, and I'm sure some of you know uh, the judge that we appeared before, Judge Mackey. Yeah. And we went to court, and he just mowed them down. He said, this is an outrageous violation. He may not have used the word outrageous, but that's the way I read the order uh, of these individuals' rights, and I deny uh, uh, the motion. And then what did the school board did, do? As great shepherds of taxpayer money, they decided to appeal that judgment. And we went up, and this is actually fine with me because, you know, when a, when a superior court issues an opinion, it doesn't have precedential effect sure does in the Court of Appeals. Went up to the Court of Appeals and we won resoundingly there. You always know uh, that things are going well when one of the first questions the judges ask you is, did you apply for attorney's fees against the school board? And like, <laughs> why, as a matter of fact, we did, Your Honor. And uh, we really wanted to teach them a lesson and we got a precedent from the Court of Appeals saying that you cannot, you cannot prevent people from exercising their right to see public records. And so those four ladies, just by looking out for their own kids' interests and the taxpayers' interests, they ended up creating a legal precedent that protects each and every one of us. And I'm very, very proud of that. And the only thing, and I mentioned this um, to the Stevenses earlier today, the only thing that I regret is that the place that I always went after every court argument, Kendall's, is no longer there. <laughs> I do like to reward myself every now and then. Yeah. Boy, uh, that was a positive reinforcement to have Kendall's right across the street. But uh, I, so uh, I really loved that experience uh, litigating here. And I'll tell you, if you find uh, a good case for us, we'll be happy to come again. The other case uh, is one that's ongoing, and I, I was trying to think of what what abuse of taxpayer funds uh, might be of, of greatest interest to you. And it's a case some of again some of you may have read about it, but for others this is going to be entirely new. It is one of the biggest scams in America. It is happening all across America, and almost no one knows about it. And it is a practice called release time. It is a practice whereby the uh, unions in the public sector negotiate for salaries and benefits with their public employees, with their public employers. And one of the provisions in almost every contract around the country is for release time. What release time is, is when you are released from your public duties you are still paid and receive your full benefits, but you work for the union. And when uh, we have had an investigative journalist who's actually just about to rejoin us, um, who did a report on this, and I couldn't believe it when he told me about this. 
In, in Phoenix, all seven municipal unions have this release time. And uh, it costs taxpayers over $2 million a year. So we looked at these contracts, and, and by the way, this is not only at this local level, this is at the federal level as well. The Veterans Administration, as you well know, is, is uh, be, beset with enormous scandals. Over 100 VA employees earn in the triple digits and never report to work. They report to union headquarters. So this is a scandal. This is a, a hidden scandal that is going on all across the country. Well, we decided to take, I, I asked my, uh, one of my attorneys, I said, look at all seven contracts and tell me which one is the worst. And that's the one we're going to take on. And it turned out that the worst one was the police union. Now, when we think of our men and, and women in blue, we have a reverence, an appropriate reverence for them. And at first, I have to tell you, we had, we had to think very carefully, are we going to take on the police union? But a union is a union. Yep. And there is no more important function that our cities provide than police services. And in Phoenix, five police officers, I'm sorry, six police officers reported to work. They were hired to patrol our streets, but instead reported every day to union headquarters. <coughs> and what did they do at union headquarters? They recruited union members. They filed grievances against the city, which cost the city millions of dollars. They lobbied, sometimes against the city's own position, and they engaged in politics on taxpayer time. They literally are released from all responsibilities, and they serve a different master. I don't know how someone can uptake and hope to uphold the Constitution and then report to duty for someone else at taxpayer expense. Well, they were taking away from these police functions. And not only that, police officers, as you know, are, are appropriately rewarded with early retirement and full pensions. These guys had, were sitting on, on desk chairs in union headquarters and not risking their lives at all, but they're still qualifying for these incredible pensions, even though they don't even report to the employer that hired them. So we took this on and we filed this lawsuit under a provision of the Arizona Constitution called the Gift Clause. The Gift Clause prohibits gifts of public funds to individuals, corporations, or associations. We used the Gift Clause to challenge the City North subsidy several years ago. Uh, in, a, in a case that went to the Arizona Supreme Court that struck down corporate subsidies. And we used the gift clause to challenge release time. And we went to court, uh, we had a trial. Uh, the judge enjoined the practice, said that it was illegal under the gift clause. The city council met uh, when, the, when the contract expired and they voted to do it again. So we had to go back to court, get another injunction, and then finally went to trial. And uh, at the end of the trial, the judge declared uh, uh, the entire practice unconstitutional. And the six police officers, and oh, by the way, I forgot to mention, it's not just the six police officers. In addition to that, they had 2,000 man hours at their disposal. So they could say, oh, we need Charlie for the day. Charlie's assigned to one of the toughest precincts, one of the toughest beats in the city. The union guy says, we need him over here. For what? You're not even allowed to ask what they're going to be doing at union headquarters that day. This is outrageous. So the judge struck this down, and those six officers had been away from their jobs for so long that they had to go back to police academy and learn how to be cops again. And I am happy to say they are patrolling the streets of Phoenix right now. This case, uh, we just argued it in the Court of Appeals. It seemed like every union in the country filed a brief on the other side. Uh, 
and uh, we are anxiously awaiting the outcome there. But talk about a precedent that could have wide-ranging impact. This is, this is it. And we've been fighting so far unsuccessfully in the legislature to get this practice taken away. It would save co collectively millions and millions of dollars of taxpayer money. But more importantly, the people that we have hired to do important jobs will be doing those important jobs again. So this is, uh, this is an incredibly important battle here. Uh, switching gears <coughs> to the ballot measures that are going to be on the ballot this year, very, very excited about them. As you know, uh, we, we have been, uh, what we've been trying to do at the Goldwater Institute is to strengthen our state constitution to protect us against the excesses of the federal government. Several years ago, we wrote an amendment called the Healthcare Freedom Act. You may remember that. Voters overwhelmingly passed it. We wrote a, a measure called Save Our Secret Ballot, which protects the right of, of employees to decide whether to have a union by secret ballot. The federal government was threatening to take that away. This year, two very important measures on the ballot. One is Proposition 122. We cannot nullify federal laws. We cannot nullify them. We fought a civil war over that. The principle was established. But we can control our own state's spending. And so what this measure will do if it's adopted by the voters is that it will uh, create a procedure by which if the legislature or the people vote uh, to uh, determine that a federal program or a federal law exceeds the powers of the federal government, no state money can be used to implement that law or policy. There is no question that this is constitutional. And if we, if we enact this this year, Prop 122, I believe many other states will enact this as well. And even in the Obamacare uh, decision, as big a disaster as that was, the court held that the federal government cannot coerce states to spend money to administer federal programs. And so this will be an incredible federalism measure uh, that we will have. And I'm, I'm happy that this came out of the, the Goldwater Institute. I'm excited about this. It's called Right to Try. This is. This is incredible. Every one of us in this room, I suspect, knows someone or has known someone with a terminal disease. And when that happens, your first instinct is to find a way to live. We live in the country that produces the greatest medical technology in the entire world. Every day, life-saving drugs or life-preserving drugs are created. But we have an obstacle, and that obstacle is called the Food and Drug Administration. In fact, liberal Hollywood last year did a movie about that agency called Dallas Buyers Club. If even liberal Hollywood can get it, I think uh, others can as well. To get a drug approved by the Food and Drug Administration, it takes 10 years and one billion dollars. They have clinical trials, but only a handful of people can participate in them. And usually in those clinical trials, half of the people who are involved in them get placebos. And as a result, they're not getting the, the, the potentially life-saving drug at all. There is a procedure for expedited a, approval of a drug. And it takes seven years instead of 10 years. Right to Try will be on the November ballot this year. And what it does is it allows drug companies to make their drugs available once they have passed the first phase of FDA approval. The first phase is the safety phase. That's why the FDA was created, was to determine drug safety. But then they, like every agency, they expanded their mission, gotten into all sorts of other things. But once safety is established, we think that people have the right to save their lives. Right now, people who have the resources leave our country to get these drugs. 
But if you don't have the resources, there's no way you can do them. So that's what Right to Try would do. In addition to getting it on the Arizona ballot, and I thank, I thank Steve and his colleagues uh, for, uh, for putting this on the ballot this year, uh, we took it to three other states. This was our first time actually taking a Goldwater idea to another state. We took it, and we didn't just take it to red states, we took it to Missouri, Colorado, and Louisiana. Two of those states have Democratic governors. Put it into the legislature in those three states, and I am very happy, proud, and excited to say that in each of those three states, right to try <coughs> passed unanimously and was signed into law by their respective governors. This is going to create a political tsunami that is going to knock the FDA on its tail. Now I think the FDA has not yet fought back and I suspect that we will have to defend a, a lawsuit at some point. But I think the reason the FDA is, has not fought back yet is because they suspect the drug companies are not going to make the drugs available to people. Why is that? Because they're investing, they're risking a billion dollars in front of the FDA. And what company is going to say, oh, we're going we're to go ahead and give a drug uh, out to individuals um, and just let the FDA take it out on us. Well, there is one company so far that has said that they're going to do this. It's a company on the East Coast called Neuralstem. It's run by a guy named Richard Garr. Richard, um, Richard and his company have developed a very promising drug to treat Lou Gehrig's disease. And it, it, it appears to, to have stupendous results. They had the clinical trial. Only 12 people got to use this drug. And the results were, were wonderful. So it's past the, the safety phase. Richards decided, though, to, to go to Colorado and to make this drug available to other people now that Right to Try has passed. And the reason is deeply personal. He says that every year, every day, he gets emails from people literally begging to get themselves or their loved ones into the clinical trial. And he knows there, there's no way to do that. And we were talking about this, and he said there's one thing that all of these people who have the disease today have in common. By the time the FDA approves this drug, each and every one of them will be dead. And I will not tolerate that. If I have a way to get this drug to them, that's why I'm doing this. And so he is going to be the courageous pioneer, and he is already putting together the facilities in Colorado to take advantage of this. So this is going to be Proposition 303 on the November ballot this year, and I encourage you to vote for both of these measures. They are incredible freedom measures. And we are now, when we look at our incredible charter schools, I'm happy my son and daughter are, uh, are at two, two of the incredible ones. When we look at the other measures that we passed here in Arizona, we are now, one of our leading businesses in Arizona is exporting freedom. But it begins here. It begins with groups like this begins with people who are determined to protect freedom in the land of Barry Goldwater right here in Arizona. And that's why I'm so proud and happy to be with each and every one of you tonight. Before concluding, I want to introduce you and ask uh, her to say a, a few quick words to a very special lady. I mentioned I was a lucky lawyer, but I'm also a lucky man to be married to Shauna Bullock, uh, who is running for the state legislature in LD28. Um, LD28 is the only um, the only legislative district that was carried by Mitt Romney, but is represented by a Democrat, uh, a guy named Eric Meyer. As you know, there's two two seats. Uh, there's a Republican in one and a Democrat in the other. I mentioned when I was talking about right to try that it passed unanimously in Missouri, Louisiana, and Colorado. It did not pass unanimously in Arizona, and Shauna's opponent 
Dr. Eric Meyer was the only physician legislator in the entire country so far who has voted against Right to Try. And uh, I am hoping that, uh, uh, that Shauna introduces him to the joys of early retirement. <laughs> so with that, I'd like to invite my bride up here, an incredibly courageous woman, and uh, hopefully she will join Steve and uh, his wonderful uh, Prescott colleagues, whoever they turn out to be. We've worked with all of them, Andy Tobin, Karen Pan. Uh, when uh, Linda Gray was in the legislature, uh, worked very closely with her. I suspect you're, you're gonna send some very good people to the legislature this year. And I hope Shauna is there to join them. So I'll say good night to you. Hand the microphone over to my wife and uh, bid you thanks and good night. Thank you. Well, this is a bit of a surprise. So I'm not taking up much time since I know your schedule is about 10 more minutes, I think, of ending and doing a silent option. Well, my name is Shauna Bullock. And I'm running for State House in LD28, which is all of Paradise Valley, Northeast Phoenix, Central Phoenix, and part of Scottsdale. And as Clint had indicated, we have uh, two incumbents in the district. One is Republican, one is a Democrat. And the Democrat who represents us was the author of the state-based health exchange bill, which is basically bringing Obamacare to Arizona. So there were many reasons why I decided to run. My kids are two main reasons. Um, we've indicated that we're big school choice supporters, and I don't believe that really either of my, any of my opponents are in favor of expanding school choice any more than, they, than it currently is, which obviously I'm very much in favor of school choice. Clint and I met each other when I worked at the Heritage Foundation back in the 1990s, and I was working on school choice back then. It's really my passion. It's something that I've worked on for almost 20 years now, and because I know that the future really relies on my kids and grandchildren and everybody else. Um, my, 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 biggest, uh, my biggest policy issue will remain education and especially school choice. Um, our primary is a bit brutal right now. I just started getting, a, getting attacked by the unions today, so at least I know I'm on their radar screen. And <laughs> thankfully I have Sal DeCicio, who is one of the biggest proponents of uh, competitive bidding and some other really good pension reforms in Phoenix. I have him backing me up. Earlier this morning, we received uh, Senator Kyle's endorsement, so we have great momentum. We have uh, Senator Flake's endorsement, uh, Bill Montgomery, who's the county attorney down there. We have wonderful people backing our campaign. We're doing really well. If you happen to know anybody who is a Republican or an independent in my district, I'd appreciate that you guys reach out to them and urge them to vote for me this primary. Um, I'm not going to take a lot of your time as I've mentioned, but you want to go see who I am. My website's obviously out there. It's Bolick for Arizona. It's B-O-L-I-C-K and then F-O-R Arizona spelled out. Um, Clint and I share um, many ideas, but not the same thing all the time. And people always think that we're connected to the brain, but thankfully we do have two different brains and we make uh, dinner conversation quite lively sometimes. <laughs> well, thanks for having us and hopefully um, whoever's in charge of the silent option can come up and take over. Yeah, okay. Thanks a lot.